In the show that I'm just winding up now, uh, The Work of the Devil, which, which contained two major revelations in the second half, one of which, the most famous one, and what it's sort of about, it was the discovery that I was donor-conceived. And um, I learned through a DNA test that I was actually conceived in a clinic in central London run by a woman called Mary Barton and her husband, Bertolt Wiesner. And the husband, Bertolt Wiesner, was, it turns out, supplying the vast majority of the sperm that was getting women pregnant over the course of about 22 years. This has become, there are other cases of this coming out. There's been one come out this week, in fact. Um, but uh, at the time and for several years, this was a standalone it's thought to a father somewhere between 600 and 1,000 children. So I have all these half-siblings. I was curious uh, to, to touch on uh, your relationship with your father. And I'm curious about, you talk about it in the show a little bit, the impact that had, because here you are, you suddenly re realize this person you've called your father and mm -hmm. thought of as your father and treated as your father uh, isn't your biological father. Mm. Uh, and it was, you know what, maybe this will be re me revealing publicly how weird my parents were, but they always asked me what, how I would feel if I'd found out I was adopted. Now, in my case, there's zero chance of that because uh. <laughs> they had me when my mother had been 18 for four days. Right. So I don't think they, they were in the adoption market, so to speak, <laughs> at all. It was a complete accident. And again, wouldn't have happened if people had thought about childbirth as carefully as you suggest they do. No. Um, but it is an interesting question, I think, and a question that most people would actually think about in some way you know, what happens if you realize that your parents or one of your parents isn't actually your parent? Yeah, it's interesting that your parents would ask you that. I mean, mine obviously steered me away from that. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine very frequently, so. you know. I mean, I remember you, I did used to think when I was, I remember very specifically having these thoughts, I think maybe eight or nine, but I can picture myself in bed thinking, I just don't think he's my dad. And yet I cannot imagine a scenario that would that would explain that because I knew I wasn't adopted because my mother had gone into a lot of detail about exactly how painful <laughs> and touch and go labor had been. You know, I was in, I think, an incubator for a couple of days and she was desperately like sad that she wasn't allowed to hold me and cuddle me. And she talks about that quite often and we get misty eyed talking about it, you know. And I was you wouldn't make that up, you know, just to kind of give plausible. <laughs> And so I knew she wouldn't have had an affair. I mean, there was like zero chance of that or anything weird like that. And obviously it never occurred to me that, that such a transgressive scenario as, uh, as artificial insemination would have been used. Well, why did you think that your dad is not your dad? Is it just because you're so good different? Good question. It's a really good question. I think at, at that age, I can't have been thinking it logically. So I think it must have been visceral. And I think what it might have been, I, I sometimes think it might have been um, like pheromones or something like that. He used to be quite affectionate. I would sit on his lap sometimes when I was little and watch TV, you know, and I would, I was very fond of him and he was a, you know, lovely big bear to hug. But I kind of felt differently about his smell and being you know, than I did about my mother's, you know, with whom I would kind of absolutely, you know, um, nestle up to like a, like a pup in a basket, you know, whereas with him, it was more like an uncle. And I do remember also, I had another uncle. I, my, we were quite a small family. My mother's an only child as well. And my father has one half-sister. His mother died very sadly before he was one. And, um, and his father remarried and, and, uh, and they had Margaret. And so Margaret is supposed to be related to me. And it turns out isn't as well. My cousins, her two daughters, were supposed to be related to me, aren't related to me. And then there was Fred, her husband, who was not supposed to be related to me. And I always instinctively felt a really strong bond with Fred because I, because I think, I don't, I'm mapping this out now, but I think it was because I didn't sense that, I, that there was something I was supposed to feel or sense that I wasn't getting. So I relaxed about it. Do you know what I mean? He was just a man who was married into our family. And so I kind of instinctively, oh, we're, we're, we're like you, you and I, we're the same, you know. But where that came from, I mean, I just don't know. Um, and I don't want any of this to, f I mean, my dad was really a great dad, you know, he was uh, a totally, uh, like a mensch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but, you know, it was weird. I know my, um, my one of my best friends, Danny uh, Solomon, who um, I was at university with, and his dad, uh, Harry Solomon. You uh, really do stick yeah. with your lot, don't you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he used to come up to you or down to Southampton occasionally and take us out for dinner. And Harry took us out for dinner, me and Danny, one time. And um, 
I just had this weird feeling like, mm, this is weird. This feels like a dad, you know? Like, uh, this is how I, you know, I, I'm getting a little kind of bat signal, like a, of a, this could be. And then when I met Jonathan Wiesner, who, again, is 78, I think, um, who is the natural-born son of Bertolt Wiesner and Mary Barton and was the kind of Rosetta Stone through which we all went, oh, we're his, he's quite like, Sir Harry Solomon, and quite like again, I mean, he's my brother, but wow. but I actually feel like he's my father. So you you genuinely feel a kinship with people to whom you're biologically related, yeah. who you perhaps hadn't met before, and yeah, that yeah. is so interesting, man. I mean, the first time I went into that room where, where they were all having lunch, the first big gathering, I was, you know, it was they were the first. There were 27 of them in there, and they were the first blood relatives I'd been in a room with, ever. Wow, basically putting aside my own mother, you know, blood relatives of any thing approaching my own tier, you know, my own generation. I mean, that's extraordinary, isn't it? At the age it of, is. what, 55 or something. Wow. You know, it reminds me of something. I was talking to a friend of mine because obviously my wife and I, we left having children quite late. Yeah. So we'll probably, you know, who knows how many we'll be able to have. I'd happily, you know, have a lot, unlikely biologically to happen. And I was talking to a friend of mine who has adopted children. And he, without being overt about it, was kind of, he was saying it's it's not as rosy a thing as you think. Mm. Now, I'm not saying that's always the case for people, but it's interesting that there is that physic, whatever, physical or whatever it yeah. is. It's yeah. so fascinating to me. But we, we, we went on this sidetrack a little bit and I asked you about the relationship with your father and what changed for you when you found out that actually you're not by, and it sounds like partly things clicked into place for you. Yeah. I mean, I suppose, yes, there's always a point, you, you lose something, I suppose. Um, we have moved into perhaps a slightly more pragmatic recognition of the truth. And I know he felt hugely relieved when um, I went up and told my parents, you know, and some people said you shouldn't do that because it, it might be of a shock to them. They might have managed to suppress that information. Apparently, there were some fathers who, you, you always attended the, the clinic together, but there were some of them that were told that their sperm would be mingled with the donor sperm and it might just encourage it forward, give it the forward propulsion. When it got there, it might be their sperm that got the woman pregnant. You know, so there might be all kinds of things that they've allowed themselves to believe. But um, when I told them, there was huge relief, definitely. And... Um, and I think he had always just felt, you know, that um, it was a fairly trivial thing, you know. And I certainly don't want to, like, kind of, like, shake him by the lapels and go, no, it's not trivial, you know, right. this is this is life itself, you know. Yeah. But my view has to be that, you know, I have to recognise the truth of it and there is a powerful bond there. But that is absolutely, of course, not to say... The thing you... I think the kind of the core philosophical conundrum that you get to through recognising it and pondering on it is there is no alternative. It's not like I could have been this or I could have... I would not exist. They may have had a child by some other means. They might have adopted or something, but I wouldn't exist. There is only one set of circumstances in which I exist, and that's it. You know, so there's no point at all in thinking I wish you this or I wish you that you know whatever or recognize it it just I wouldn't be you know 